began, um, and it was very much about women. Uh, gender, as we know, is not about women necessarily, but that's how it started in geography, thinking about why there weren't women in geography. And so we had this very large organization called the American Association of Geographers. Some of you who are geographers may have heard of it, or it's our national US-based institution. And in, in that institution, they have specialty groups that, rec that sort of represent each of our different area studies. So that began in the 1980s, and we called it, this is the title of my talk, you can see here, it, the, the special two group was called Geographic Perspectives on Women. So that's indicate that's how we began to think about why, how would it would matter to think about geography, big geography, large-scale geography, how we arrange the world, and little geography, how we arrange our spaces and think about our spaces, if we consider women as well as men. So the, the group was called originally Geographic Perspectives on Women. The, we be, then began to realize, and I have used some authors to inspire what I want to talk about. Um, one is a, a woman named Anne McClintock, who wrote a very, um, at least in my work, a very famous book called Imperial Leather. And her book was about the making of empires, European empires and US empires. A very large and important book. And she really uh, highlights not necessarily the role of women in the making of empires, but the role of gender dynamics, of gendered ideologies, meaning how is it that in particular times and particular places, people think about and make norms about what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. So I'm calling those gendered ideologies. Of course, they change. We hope they change, and they are different in different places. So her project was trying to understand the ways in which thinking about gender and sexuality in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was critical to the making of European empires and US empires. And I can, show you if, you, if you want to, I think, I hope her book is in Spanish, it's an amazing book. That was in 1990, so it gives you some sense of the dates when we were thinking about these issues. And my work, as you see, was very much inspired by, by her work. Um, the other thing that began to be introduced in gender and geography was thinking not necessarily only about ideologies, ideas, set ideas about what it is to be a proper woman and what it is to be a proper man, but also what's incorporated in performing the actual acting out, the embodiment of being a man and being a woman. So that's called gendered performances. Um, and a person I've used to talk about that is Linda McDowell, another prominent British geographer um, who wrote a very, a, for me, a wonderful book about how gender, how people performed gender, acted out literally gender uh, on the, the, the floors, the streets of the city of, New, of London, so literally in the financial sector. So she was trained as an economic geographer. And she said, we can't understand the ways that the economy functions unless we understand how masculinity and femininity are being performed actually within the banking industry, the finance industry, and so on and so forth. So those were two things that began to inspire my work, thinking both about gendered ideologies, sets of ideas about gender, about men, about women, about different versions of masculinity and femininity, and also how we embody and act out and perform as I am doing right now, right? I am probably acting out a particular version of feminine academic, probably. I have probably have an idea of what a, a woman academic is supposed to be like. So that's how gender and geography began to evolve in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and then this, this last slide here is to talk about what's happening more today. Just last year, this specialty group, this group of geographers who were first called Geographic Perspectives on Women, that was our title. We just changed our name, and that's what's the GPOW to FGSG, which is now called the Feminist Geographies Specialty Group. And that signals both a change or a widening from thinking not only about women, but thinking about women and men, thinking about gender, thinking about gendered ideologies and performances, and also thinking about feminism and feminist approaches and feminist methods which may have little to do with women per se. So it was quite the, you can imagine getting, you know, I don't know how many members of that group, probably about 3,000 people to agree on a name change. It was, quite the, um, it was quite the effort on a lot of people's part, but it was really important and indicates this shift. So here I'm trying to give you some sense of how that happened. Uh, another book, again, I just tried to pick out what was important to me in my, in my development of thinking through gender and geography. Um, and one of them is written by a set of two women, joint authors, J.K. Gibson Graham, who wrote a book called The End of Capitalism, 
as we know it. So you can see her book, their book. I guess that they author jointly but under one name, which is an interesting politics, which we could talk about. Um, and they were trying to think about something very, that people think is so unrelated to gender or to women, which is to how to theorize capitalism. And what if they, they began to think, what if we don't say capitalism big C, this big thing that exists out there that somehow seems overwhelmingly difficult to change, what if we think about it as something far more partial, indeterminate, intimate, and therefore able to be changed in our daily lives? And that they call a feminist approach. So that's an interesting way. That's a whole other way of thinking about what feminism might mean in geography or social sciences or in other related uh, fields. So that was very um, uh, important for me to kind of take big ideas, big concepts that seem overwhelming and begin to see them as what they would call partial, incomplete, always in the midst of being changed and therefore always able to be changed. Um, and that was a quite, we would say, of an approach that was, they call a feminist approach. Um, and the second essay is by another, I'm obviously putting up the people I'm fans of my heroes. So uh, the second quote is from a woman named Jennifer Hinman, and she is usually famous for developing this field called feminist geopolitics, um, which is thinking through the field of political geography. How do we understand all the things that are happening today that are not just only financial, but are every day in our lives about politics, borders, she in particular studies refugees and resettlement efforts. Uh, so she's very timely, her work is very timely. And her idea about feminist geopolitics is to say, boy, political geography and political scientists often think about things, these large things called nations and states and big theories about nations and states that seem to have very little to do about people. And Jennifer Hinman's development was to say, it's multi-scalar. Politics impacts us at all different scales including the scale of the intimate, of ourselves, of our bodies, of our houses, right, of our families, of our lives. And that, that be, and so by looking at the different scales, this, this different scalar approach to analyzing power relationships, she's calling that, again, a feminist approach. So this has been sort of a, just a very, very brief summary of what seems to me some of the developments in gender and geography over the past 25 years in the United States or in the kind of Anglo, English speaking world. So I'd say that's United States, Canada, um, and the UK. So I think that's really where these ideas have been more dominant. Um, and so from that, I just tried to pick out what are the things happening? What, what excites me today uh, when I read the journals? Um, you do know that we have a journal in English called Gender, Place, and Culture, um, which subtitle is the Journal of Feminist Geography. So that's very exciting. Um, so I've been trying to read through and think about what are the new ideas emerging in the 21st century that are coming through the lens of what we might call feminist theory, feminism in geography. So I just picked out these three. I think there's, of course, many more. Um, these are the ones that are interesting to me. And in some ways, they're very related. So the, the first one, and one which has always been present in thinking about gender issues, but has become even more present and very difficult to ignore, which is to think about not the fact that not all women are alike. Of course, it seems quite obvious. However, um, at the beginning, somehow, sometimes to be strategic, as you probably know in the Gender Institute and in your strike, sometimes you have to strategically um, ignore differences uh, to, co to form collectives to create movements, social movements. But by doing that, sometimes we forget and obscure the way that women and men and all of us are very different. And so one of the theoretical insights and empirical insights of the past couple of years is called feminist geographies of difference. So how power operates through different categories, of course, not just through gender, but through race and ethnicity, class, age, ability, disability, indigeneity, so this is a very big issue with indigenous peoples. So it has a whole array of different ways that power operates and different women and different men are situated differently along that continuum. Secondly, and again, this is, these are all related, this is a very big area of research today in the US and the UK in terms of gender and geography, if you put those together, which is thinking through um, sexualities, not just, I just heard that the, the sexualities and space specialty group just changed its name. 
um, this week, but I've forgotten what its new name is. And that's to indicate that it's not necessarily about that. It's about transsexuality, queer geographies, and queer geographies might be unthinking the binaries that have situated a lot of our theories. So to think through sexual identities, subjectivities, practices, communities, all those sorts of differences, and how they might change our way of understanding power, the economy, our representations, our culture, and our art. So that's a second very large area of research happening today. Um, and the third, way, the third issue is something that in some ways is related and actually you know, covers the other two. And you probably, I'm, you're, I'm not probably, you already know about these things. It's something called intersectionality. Um, it was a, a theory developed by black feminists in the United States, but I'm guessing probably um, in Mexico there's probably another version also. So we can, everyone can claim a version of this, which is to think theoretically and empirically about how different identities intersect and overlap and often compound each other. So as, for example, black women in the United States often find themselves both sexually oppressed and racially oppressed, and it's more than just one and one equals two, right? Sometimes it's one and one equals 10. So they compound each other. And that's what's called it, that's a theory, again, originally established by Kimberly Crenshaw, but has become quite, uh, it's, it's become part of the language of, of the kind of critical, we call in America, critical geographies, critical geographies field, um, and is very, very important. Um, I will try then to show some of these issues in my research, and I can't wait to hear your questions. I would, if I was teaching a class right now, I'd have to stop immediately and say, does any of that make sense to you? But I hope some of that makes sense to you. Okay, so just going, so that's kind of big picture, kind of my big ideas of what I think is, what I think is happening um, and what I think is interesting intellectually, um, empirically, and actually in our everyday political lives. Um, I am trained as a historical geographer so um, I, would I said to Fatima, if I had known there was a strike going on here on campus, I might have um, added some other case studies that would be a little more pertinent to the moment, uh, a little more contemporary. But here's from my research, uh, some case studies. As I said before, I have spent the past maybe ooh, probably 15 years trying to think critically about the making of a United States political and economic empire using historical gendered methods to think through those issues. Um, in the first part of that project, I was looking at American corporations, and I, excuse me for using the word American. I know what I really mean is US, right? Because you are also Mexican. Mexico is America. Uh, US corporations that were becoming global in the early years of the 20th century. So I was trying to understand how the US was becoming an economic global power before the US was a political global power and before it had a military global power. It's kind of interesting. So in the early 20th century, the United States was not a global superpower. It was other countries, the UK and Germany, other countries were dominating parts of the global market. So I was interested in understanding the ways in which that happened. So here are some of the pieces of that in which gender really played a major role. So it might seem sort of strange, but two of the largest companies that America was, was, that were global at the time, were manufacturing companies. The United States was, the man, was manufacturing things then. It's hard to make, it's hard to understand. And two of the things that they, they were manufacturing were sewing machines. So I think some of you may have heard of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. I know they were here in Mexico. Uh, Singer was uh, America's largest international company at the turn of the century. Um, with, and I'll show you some of their uh, a map of eight, already by 1879, so very early. This is just the number of their offices in 1879, but you can see um, by 1906, this company, this is the number of shops, of retail shops that they had established around the world. So very early in a time, again, when the United States was not a superpower, was not, did not have military bases everywhere, um, did not really have geopolitical power everywhere. At that time, this is where they had some of their shops and their offices. So I think, I'm not quite sure, I think that central circle is Mexico City. So that's good that we have, a, we have something that relates it here. So this, become, this became an interesting study for me because of course it was a company that was selling products mostly about women to women. So even though a lot of its products, sewing machines, were being used in factories to make textiles, 
um, in their advertising and in their promotion of themselves as a company, they focused not on production in a manufacturing plant, but on every woman in her own home having her own sewing machine. Because according to the late 19th century notions, the gendered ideology of the time, right, middle class women were meant to not be working in a factory, but were meant to be home being housewives, and therefore that, this is where they, they situated a lot of their promotional material. They were very involved in advertising, very big advertising company. That was one of their main claims to fame, how they sold a lot of their machines. If anyone's interested in other details about this company, I have way too many that can be sh shared for another time. <laughs> no, too many details, but I'm just going to focus on some of their advertising. They were very interested then in using notions of the US woman, white woman, right? The patriarchal family, the so-called heteronormative, that's a long word, patriarchal family as the proper family to promote their products overseas and interestingly to promote American women or US women buying these products by saying that they were part of what I'm calling the, what they called Singer's sisterhood of women. So they were, one of their active tools, promotions, advertisements, was from the 1880s onward, a series of trade cards. Oops. Yep, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, you can see them here. Uh, they produced these trade cards for over 30 years in different series, and people collected them. And they represent, each one was presented quite similarly. They each represent a different country or area of the world. And you see them kind of details up there. We have Cuba, China, China, and Korea here. Um, and what I'm showing them is that women in the United States, they obviously, this is at a time when paper was quite expensive. So they're actually reusing, uh, you can see on the one side, their children were using it to draw on and practice their English. And above was originally an accounting book. So they have taken old books and they're now using them to collect their cards. And they're collecting a vision of the world, a kind of geography lesson, right? They are learning, American US women are learning about the world as Singer is presenting it to them. Does that make sense? So here is what Chinese women look like. They dress like this. Here is what Korean people look like. They dress like this. Singer, of course, was making clothing, and therefore they were interested in presenting clothing, right, as sort of indicators of difference. So they were using this to show that there's, this is what people dress like. But in fact, the cards are all very similar. They were kind of presenting a United Nations of Singer, right? Everyone is kind of similar, sort of, um, and they're all proper women. And you can see that here in these cards that were collected, um, again, in these, uh, these books that people had. I've tried to include, here's, here's some of them as they were, a woman had collected them. And you can see uh, one of Mexico down at the bottom, which is rep supposed to represent the Yucatan. Um, and then we have more of China, Edinburgh, somehow a city, a city got there as well as a country, Turkestan, Burma, and Hungary, okay? So you can see this was a way that US women in some ways could gather a vision of the world. What vision of the world were they learning? That's the interesting question. So um, I've written a book about this, and so I, I sort of say, well, in some ways, it was the fact that this was a bit of an equalizer, that all women, if they use the sing or sewing machine, will eventually become like us. And what's us? US white women, right? So if everybody continues to sew, they will become proper. They can make their clothing. They'll become proper women and potentially become along, moving along the hierarchy and become a little bit more like US women. But it was also a way for US women, many, most middle class and working class US women who had never had a chance to see the world. And there was no TV or radio, right? So this was their way of learning, a kind of, as I said, a geography lesson, a kind of textbook of what was going on in the world. Uh, just a couple details, that's the one of Mexico to give you there you go, Mexico, sorry. <laughs> I see we have our clicker here. And if you go to the next one, you can see that this is similar. This is the way they did want make one of the United States. Okay, so they are saying, yes, United States, we are all part of this gendered world of sing or sewing machines. Um, and you, US woman, you are helping to participate in this by using your singer machine at home. Uh, this was an interesting trade card that I spent a lot of time on because it's one of the few that they used to represent people who aren't white. 
So this is Zululand in South Africa. Um, it's an interesting trade card for many reasons. In some senses, it is very much in tune with or in line with the other cards. It is, in fact, a heteronormative family. We have the father, the patriarch, standing there leaning on his cane. He is doing the correct role, right, of the patriarch of the family. Um, the mother is sewing at her machine, and the children are all arraigned around them as you would in any kind of Victorian notion of U.S. proper heteronormative families. So in some ways, it's suggesting that perhaps even peoples, and this was, of course, part of the British Empire, right? Remember, U.S. was always trying to make itself superior to the British Empire, which is we, didn't, uh, we weren't making an empire through guns. We were making an empire through sewing machines, right? So therefore, we, U.S., was more civilized. So in some senses here, we're representing the U.S. as superior to England, because we, and, and also the Singer sewing machine helping to bring U.S. forms of civilization to the world. Remember, U.S. women considered themselves, there was the U.S. white man, and then there was maybe the U.S. white woman, and then there was a whole hierarchy of people in the world, of which people in Zululand would not have been considered particularly high, if you think about early 20th century ways of seeing the world. And yet here, this is a very interesting image. It was a very popular card. A lot of U.S. women collected this one because it was so interesting and exotic, I suppose. And again, it was the U.S. and Singer Sewing Machine legitimizing its sales and having people buy them here at home by learning about the world, but by learning about a kind of particular form of civilization, that's a big term, of which gender ideology and patriarchal norms were very much a part. So that's why I say gender and patriarchy played a big role in this. Singer had other advertising campaigns that were very much uh, influenced by this, a similar kind of thing. This is a little bit later. I like the image because what is it? Do you, you see the globe there at the bottom? Um, and women's influence is taking over the world. So this was another part of gender ideology of the early 20th century, which is women were considered the civilizers, right? They could, through their, this was part of American U.S. progressive era, women, through their duties at home, through their duties with local governments, through their duties being proper housewives, were helping to bring progress to their families into the nation. And the idea was Singer was promoting that perhaps US women could do this all around the world with the help of the sewing machine. If you can see the sewing machine, she is pointing to her sewing machine to her right, if you can see that image wherever we are behind us. So that women's influence is enveloping the world and everyone will be raised into a higher level of progress. And you can see part of this advertising campaign was to talk about how women are just doing so great in the US. They are rocking it. Okay, I'm joking. So one of their advertising things was to look at the women's century from 1800 to 1900. Wow, women in the US are progress. Okay, women couldn't vote in the United States right in 1900. That doesn't seem to be mentioned here. But you can see that in no country, if you read the, you have your Spanish there, thank you for doing all the translations. Why is it that women are really rocking it in the US, it's because of all of using the, all of their labor-saving devices like sewing machines, you see. So the sewing machine is helping to liberate women in the United States, and of course, therefore, it can help liberate women elsewhere. And you can see the images on the left are the old woman of 1800, and the images of the right are the new woman. And there was a whole you know, set of ideologies about what this new woman was meant to be. So this is another way that Singer used gender ideology to promote its products, both in the United States and, of course, worldwide. And here's where you see it. Um, in a, in a, they also then promote this image with some using their trade cards and their text. This is the trade card. This is a newer one in the early 20th century to talk about in China that, oh my gosh, things are not very good in China. This is what they're saying here. But maybe if we sell enough sewing machines in China, women will be liberated. I, I say this, and I put this in quotes and emphasize it, because this is still very much the way that American uh, government, and perhaps the American government, the US government, when it promotes gender equality in other countries, so I uh, also work, my new project thinks more about United States international development, 
the US Agency for International Development, one of the measures they adopt for so-called progress around the world is the degree to which women are equal to men. It's very much a kind of imperial view right, of you exporting its gender. And here you already you see it here in 19, 1905, 1910, which Singer using that same kind of imperial view to show, oh, we can help save women elsewhere in the world. We are so good here. Even though we can't vote in the United States, still we're going to save women around the world. Um, again, you can see these. These were some of the countries. Russia was uh, Singer's largest market before, before the revolution. Um, and they were very much interested in promoting their products in Russia, and I have a series of th issues and parts of articles that I've written about this. Um, and so they're very interested in talking about how they can really help liberate Russian women uh, by using sewing. Okay, so that's one case study. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. That's just a little tidbit of it. Um, and I'm, then I'll talk you through a, a related case study, which is another large company that was global in the United States which called itself International Harvester. I think you might know, if, if, if any of you come from farming regions in Mexico, you might have heard of it. It also had a large manufacturing plant in the Yucatan because it used sizzle to make its ropes when it was harvesting its companies that made harvesting equipment. Um, it was a company that becomes known as International Harvester only later. Originally, it was called uh, McCormick, and then it bought out all of its competitors as one could do, and created a monopoly. But here you can see the extent of its uh, sales, foreign branch offices, in 1914. So again, a very large uh, international, U.S. international company. Again, before U.S. was a geopolitical power and before it was had you know, bases around the world. Now this is a complicated image. I will try to talk a little bit slower about it because it sort of sets up the whole notion of what International Harvester was drawing on. It's gendered ideologies, nationalistic ideologies, an ideology that used the term civilization to present the US, white people in the US, as the top of progress, and everybody else in the world as the bottom of progress and on a hierarchy. International Harvester then, same thing with Singer, they were sort of promoting the idea that if you use the International Harvester machine, you could make your way up the hierarchy of civilization. So this is a complicated image, but it's fun. Okay, how big is it? You probably can't see it. I should have made a handout to give to everybody. But this is one of their common advertising motifs, and you're supposed to read it in time from the left up here, and it goes down, and then it goes back up there. So it's temporal. And here's how it starts. The first image at the very top, as you can see, this is what farming was like long ago before we had harvesting machines, before we had farm equipment. And you see the pigs are getting in the middle of the fields, and it's very confusing, and oh my gosh, things aren't good. The second image, it's a little bit later. This is supposed to be 1820. So what happens in 1820? Oh, they had developed this way of cutting down the wheat but oh my gosh, there's women working in the fields. That is not correct gender ideology of the turn of the century. So clearly these people are not advanced yet because there's women doing manual labor. That wasn't supposed to be. Then if you go down to the third image here, this is now 1830, so then they developed this other technology called the grain cradle, which is a way of harvesting wheat. And again, now the women seem to have disappeared, so things are getting better, okay? Start up at the top here. Now we see, aha, aha, the very first McCormick Reaper, developed in 1831, big date in International Harvester's history. And what do we have here now? We have proper men, starting to be proper men, sitting on top of horses and machines, where they should be, right on high, right, looking down over their workers in their fields without any sign of women around, and they are now reaching the top of human civilization. And you can see they just follow 1869. Now they have a better mechanized machine. And at the bottom one, this is 1883, and that was at the time the latest machine to come out, and they were promoting it. And if you look at detail, of course, which I have, this bottom image, you can see what's happened to the pigs. They have all been put in their place. They have been slaughtered, ready to be eaten over here on the right. You see them hanging up? So they have been put in their place. Animals should not be in the fields, obviously, right? That's bad. And what's on the left? 
Those, all, all the old technologies, can you see them? The old cradle hook and the old reaping hook. They've all, yes, thank you. Who's doing that? You're wonderful. And uh, they, they were sure to include like spider webs to show that that is the past, right? That is the past. We are no longer like that. We are this. An international harvester took this idea, which is not just their idea. I mean, of course, this was a sort of set of ideas of gendered civilizational ideas that floated through the United States at this time. They took that and really put it into visuals and used it in almost all their advertising. As you can see, they then, and we now have an image that's a little bit better, same idea, but here what they're doing is they're transposing time and space. Ah, so what Anne McClintock in that famous book calls anachronistic space. Because if you look at the image here, okay, to the right, yes, that's called Reaper of the, that's old technology, the ancient Gauls, the ancient Brits and Fran French people, that's the kind of technology they, they used in the very first century AD. Very primitive, quote unquote. And you can see below women working the field. You can see this is the past, right? But what is this over here? The present, and the interesting image is the circle. Because who's in the circle? It's contemporary India. It's almost the same man. Do you see that? So what they're saying is, India, so they're taking time and space and playing with it, as many people in the United States did. India represents our past. It's not, it, it, you know, maybe it will catch up if we sell it enough machinery. That's the notion. So this image was very interesting to me. I said, literally, it's almost the same person. They seem they just moved him over, right? So what they're saying then is different countries in the world are aligned according to a civilizational hierarchy. The United States is here, and everybody else is sort of happening, and some of those places represent our past, right? And maybe if we help them along with machines and sell them enough products, and maybe later on, after World War II, give them some money and bring them some technology, maybe we can then help them become sort of like us, okay? Very powerful set of ideas that were not just International Harvester, of course, they were drawing on these ideas from, from the United States. So this is how they were selling their products. Um, this is from 1900, an exhibit in Paris, what they were showing, and again, they're saying that Asia, you know, is going to become, the text is not that important, you know, pretty soon, this is the technology now, if they use enough of American technology, they will become civilized and we'll sell them a lot of that technology. And other images, again, they were obsessed with India, as you can imagine. India was a, a grain growing region like Russia. They were really interested in having their products there. They were also, of course, very interested in Mexico. Here's their trade. They also did trade cards, trade card of the United States. And I tried to find the trade card for Mexico. This represents Mexico. Um, it's not quite the same, but they are show, trying to show how they can sell their machinery to, to Mexico um, and perhaps also make Mexico, which represents the United States' past, right? Somehow could maybe catch up a little bit with the sale of International Harvester. And again, you can see that there are cards about Algiers and um, this is the image from the poster, which I sent to Fatima. I also used it as the cover of my book. Um, this is, in some ways, encapsulating, this is an advertisement for International Harvester. Uh, it was a beautiful color image. Um, it is drawn from a, a very famous Renaissance painting called The Geography Lesson. So if any of you are here in art history, you might have heard of this uh, painting. Um, and then there's a Vermeer version of it, and it's been through many versions. This is International Harvester's version. And again, what are we in? We're in an American, U.S., white, middle class, maybe upper middle class parlor, right? We're in this beautiful parlor decorated with all the finery, beautiful walls and mirrors and so on and so forth. And we have the patriarch teaching his children the geography lesson, teaching them about geography. So there's the globe, there's an atlas, and then there's a series of books, geography books, around her. her. So he's teaching both his son, most importantly, 
but also his daughter too, right, about the world. And what is the world out there that's being made? Well, you can see that in the painting, right? That's the international, that's the man atop his harvester, right? You know, bringing civilization by literally civilizing and bringing cereals. The globe actually says, um, on my children, on this globe, you see uh, the harvest fields of the world where, where the international harvester is always king. So it's not, not so subtle, but okay, there you go. So the international harvester. And again, they use this imagery constantly to talk about uh, the balance of power in the United States. You can see the United States Capitol. Maybe you could see it. They're trying to show how the farmer, the American white man farmer, is really the central figure in American politics, the true American uh, and the highest level of civilization. And what makes him so powerful? Well, if you look down, you see he's on his McCormick Reaper. Okay, that's the basis of his power. Very, you know, again, nothing very subtle. Okay, so flash forward just a little bit. Um, and this is to lead you to my talk tomorrow, if anyone's interested in coming to this. I gave a little advertisement. Um, no. <laughs> that, um, so International Harvester was interested not only, and in fact, um, it never, unlike Singer, uh, it never sold more of its machines outside the United States than inside, meaning it was always a higher internal market than, than a domestic, it was a domestic market. Um, but, it made it, but it liked to have all this advertising about how it was international, of course, its name. Um, one of their targets for where they were very interested in selling their machines, or at least where they were very interested, and here you see a map from 1917, of where they were going to go send the international harvester farm experts, rural experts, reformers, where they were going to go send them to help people. It was kind of part of their advertising. They were going to send out their... They hired folks who knew about agriculture and the new agricultural improvements. I know this was a reform effort that also was happening in Mexico in the 1920s and 1930s. There was a lot of rural reform efforts. This is one of those, and you can see where they target, the places they're very interested in, is the American South, right? Particularly the states of Alabama, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And there's a very particular reason why that, those were the places they were interested in is because that's where most of the farming was done by black people, and this was the area where the, the largest amount of money was being made by the United States on its agricultural commodities, and that was the production of cotton. So it was an area, it was a focus both of international harvesters' interest and of the United, later on of the United States government becomes very interested in rural reform in this area. And so you begin to see issues, as I've called it, I remember I've tried to talk a little bit here about gendered ideologies, I mentioned a little bit about gendered performances and representations, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe intersectionality, which is thinking through the, how gender and race played themselves out. So these are people from International Harvester, they're experts, who are on their way. They're in Reform, Alabama, just in the middle of the Cotton Belt, so I've been there and seen these places. They're bringing their slides, they're, show, they're going to show black farmers how to be better farmers. And the interesting issue is why were they so focused on this? Or what was going on here? Here you can see, oops, did I, did I click through? On, this is in some ways the telling image. This is from International Harvester. These photographs were taken by their experts. And I'll read the caption slowly. It says, this picture, see what do we have here? Women and children with a hand, hand plow. This picture was not taken in Egypt, nor India, nor Africa but in Alabama, near Enon, and shows the primitive methods still in use among the miserably poor colored people of the South. So again, a time, space, right, juxtaposition, even here in the United States, so-called, right? We have people using primitive methods of technology, meaning we have undeveloped peoples in the United States. So International Harvester, and then of course it's not just International Harvester, the United States government becomes very interested in this for all sorts of reasons. Um, and this image to me when I found it in the International Harvester archive said to me, aha, I think I have a new project that I should investigate. But I luckily just kept it um, and put it aside for my next project. But this also shows you how gender and race, right, because it's women and children, right, using, they are clearly not civilized. They are clearly not white. Right? This is something very problematic. This is if we think about theoret theories that are happening now in, in American US geography and related social sciences, we might start using theories of racial capitalism 
to talk about this because the largest American export in 1915 was cotton. And cotton was having problems being manufactured and being exported. So we might begin to think about the combination of race and money and capitalism happening here, but that's a whole other project for tomorrow. <laughs> um, and again, you can see International Harvester is just very interested. There are there two, I know these two women who were trained by International Harvester, they had college degrees. Um, and they were trained to be what we today call home economics professors. I don't know if that, that um, home reform, I don't know if there's a term for that in Spanish, uh, to basically civilize and bring development through domestic chores, teaching people how to be better housewives, better food, better health, right? Because these are all very key issues to development. So here we have International Harvesters sending their women to interfere in, again, with you see black families that are so poor, that's what the caption says, that they have to make brooms out of sticks. So this is what the caption is making clear, and they talked a lot about this. Uh, so again, you see gender white women bringing to so-called black children a whole series of interventions that to later on we might call development. And I'll end with this image, uh, which is what this, we might say, it's one of the arcs not, there are many arcs that lead to this, but one of the roots of what becomes American development efforts in the post-war era is this. Uh, United States government, under the guise of the United States Agency for International Development and the State Department, sends women, white women, to other countries to bring civilization to them, to develop them, to bring health care, uh, literacy, um, better food preparation, so on and so forth. And th these images, these are from the, the late 1950s, 19, early 1960s. And I just like them because on the one on your left shows a, a US white woman looking at the world, of course, another image of the globe, and yet on the ground is actually a total mishmash of every kind of undeveloped place. There's farms, there's forests, there's mountains, there's palm trees. It's, it's just like the invention of the third world, right? That's what we're really seeing here, all put together. And then the, the right is, a, is they just kept, they kept changing the, the picture. They updated the picture a little bit. I also know that these books were given out to Peace Corps volunteers, um, which is very interesting. Similar kinds of books were provided to the Peace Corps so that this kind of thing continues. So anyway, I'll, I'll end with that because that leads you into my project for tomorrow. But I think hopefully it highlights some of the gendered ideologies, performances, practices, intersectionality, some of the new issues that are happening in gender geographies today. Thank you. Hola a todas y todos. Thank you, Mona, for such a thought-provoking and um, informative um, Talk. Um, me toca hacer el comentario el día de hoy. Um, creo que por cuestiones de eh, facilidad es mejor hacerlo en inglés para que también podamos tener una interlocución con Mona. Eh, por cierto, yo soy Amneris Chaparro, soy investigador y secretaria académica del CIEG. Entonces voy a hacer mi comentario en inglés y después abrimos a preguntas y respuestas para tener un diálogo entre todas y todos. Um, well, I was just saying about the dynamics that we're going to be following. <laughs> okay, good. Um, first of all, well, again, thank you very much for this very interesting, informative, and thought-provoking um, talk. I have to say, I am not a geographer, um, <laughs> so full disclosure. Um, I am, however, a political theorist, and I work on feminist political theory, so um, I, I also, well, I'm, I'm at the, um, uh, at the uh, research, uh, research um, for gender um, center here. Um, and I want to tell you that we used to be an academic program. Um, our center was an academic program for 25 years. Uh, it just became a center uh, recently, three years ago. So maybe there's hope for you oh, okay. <laughs> back at your <laughs> university. Um, and I also, um, I think one of the main um, 
things that I can gather from this talk as a non-geographer is that we can rethink about the way we occupy space as gender subjects. And not only the way we do it, but also the way we create knowledge. And that I am talking particularly about women in academia, right? Um, and then that led me to think a little bit about, um, I was reading your work. Um, uh, for, I've been reading your work for the past uh, couple of weeks, and I found it very interesting that, um, to me, it seems very obvious that gender and race um, and class are uh, key dimensions to understanding the world. So I was like thinking, how come uh, feminist geography is not mainstream, right? Um, how come there, there are other uh, disciplines or subdisciplines of um, geography, human and cultural geography, that do not take this into account. Um, but I guess uh, that the answer is not only uh, for geography itself to, to, to say, but uh, academia in general, like we are still, gender is still a niche mm -hmm. uh, discipline. It's still a dimension that is not taken uh, too seriously as it should be, right? Um, however, um, what it does, it does is that it unveils what has always been part of history, um, but it was not taken into account, which is not only women, but also racialized women and um, women of color and um, working class women. So um, all this I gather from, from reading your work and now um, from listening to you. So thank you very much for that. Um, and well, my, my comment, I, I was thinking about how interesting it is, is that you focus on late 19th century and early 20th century American imperialism because that's, I guess, my intuition is that that is the place in history where we find the roots of contemporary social imaginary mm -hmm. on gender and how American imperialism has had a say in um, putting forward an idea of what women should be like and what men should be like. Um, on, on that, I was um, wondering um, for, maybe this is not a very fair question, but I'm gonna uh, feel free not to answer it. Um, in, in feminist geography, who is the subject of feminist geography? I mean, that is the million dollar question for all people who work on gender, who should be the subject of feminist theory, feminist theorizing? So how do you deal with that question in, 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 in feminist geography? Who is the subject of study there? Uh, because some people will say, well, it's obviously women. And others will say, well, no, it's not only women, it's also those uh, who embody values of femininity regardless of their biology. So I don't know if that is a question that you have had in, 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 in your work in, in, in geography. Um, and also, I was thinking about um, how interesting it is to um, see the input that big companies like the Singer uh, company had in creating these ideas, these global ideas of womanhood. I remember that my grandmother used to have a Singer sewing machine in her house, and then my mother inherited it. She never used it, though. Uh, it was just like an ornament at home, but she was very proud, she is very proud of it, though I don't think she has it anymore. Um, but she was very proud of it because it was bought in the US. So it was not only that it was just uh, this idea of womanhood, but it was also this idea of we have an American product in our home. And that also is very telling of how there's this um, this approach to American um, consumerism, right? Um, but then on this narrative um, put forward by uh, the Singer Company um, that tries to build an idea of what women should be like, I mean, regardless of who you are or where you are, you have a sewing machine and that creates this notion of sisterhood. I could not help but think that this 
conceals uh, the other side of capitalism, which is women in sweatshops and in factories. And that is a very interesting thing for um, feminist uh, history because the first uh, strikes that are recorded in the 19th century, for example, in the US, came from um, garment workers uh, in factories in the 1850s. And it was women who had these very precarious jobs in, in sweatshops and in factories. And, and um, so they were the other side of this idea of sisterhood. They were real uh, sisters in the sense that they had these um, common goals of not being exploited by their employers, right? Uh, by their employees. Um, so I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that because it's very interesting also. We celebrate the 8th of March as uh, International Women's Day. And the reason we do that is because there was this big uh, fire in a factory in New York. And those women who were striking were seamstresses, right? Uh, so there's this notion that um, something that might seem so innocent as a sewing machine uh, not only had this impact on creating an imaginary, an imaginary idea of what women all over the world should be like, but also in the sweatshops it created forms of resistance and political uh, acts uh, that are very important for feminist history. So I, I would like to, to see if you have some thoughts on that. Um, also... Um, thinking about your presentation and about, um, again, the way structures work, and it seems that, and this is something that uh, we, we know a lot of in, in feminist theory, that you know you have patriarchy as a system that is very oppressive, a system of domination uh, in which women take the worst part of it, and then you have capitalism, which is also a system of domination and oppression, um, and they seem to do pretty well together, like they synchronize and and then we have uh, not only one problem but two problems, that of uh, capitalism and that of patriarchy. Um, and it seems that when we talk about these two systems or these two huge overwhelming structures, um, there's little room for freedom, for individual freedom. Um, however, as I think the case of the um, garment workers' strikes, the female garment garment workers' strikes shows, there is room for freedom, there is room for political action. But I wonder if you have considered um, saying something a bit more about freedom uh, in that sense, like um, how, for example, um, these people who you showed us in uh, on the slides, um, uh, racialized people, uh, black families, did they have, is it possible to trace back in the archives different forms of um, agency that they would um, use to resist uh, mm -hmm. these systems of domination, both patriarchal and capitalist? Um, and I was also trying to understand this notion of gender ideology that you use. Because I think nowadays in Mexico, we use it in a different way. Like, I think there's this idea of gender ideology as a device uh, used by um, right-wing groups in Mexico, mostly, you know, the church um, or, or some Christian denomination um, communities that, um, talk about gender ideology as um, something sinful. Like they say, oh, this, for example, they, they say of us at the center, uh, these uh, women, they are uh, infusing children. They want to infuse children this gender ideology uh, in which the kids won't have any roles and, and they, don't, they won't have any role models and, and, and a boy won't be a boy and a girl won't be a girl. So there's this misuse probably of the word, of the concept gender ideology. And I think that you're aiming at something different when you talk about gender ideology. So I wonder if you, I mean, I understand what you're trying to say, but I would like you to clarify it a bit more because I guess in this context mm -hmm. it might be misinterpreted uh, because we have this connotation 
mm -hmm. um, because of the right wing um, agenda uh, that is against, well, women and mm -hmm. human rights, basically. Um, and uh, I don't want to take much time, but um, I also was wondering if um, you could tell us a bit more about how um, the how companies like the International Harvester contributed to not only uh, keeping people in their place, but also making those places for these people. Uh, like it's, I guess it has to do with a the way the U.S. has been built as a nation, mm. um, and it's not a coincidence that these companies took advantage of racial segregation. But I wonder if these companies had a say not only in keeping people in their places, but in 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 creating those places for mm. those people. Because I, th I guess the the photographs that you showed are very telling. You have this lineup of white people, including women. That's interesting. But and in the corner. I think there was a black man uh, just, you know, peeking. Um, so um, I, I wonder if you have any any thoughts on that, if you could share them with us. Um, and I think I'm going to just um, kind of leave it there. I, I guess we have more comments from, from all of you and from the audience. Um, and according to the schedule, just let me have a quick look. Um, so, um, okay, sure. Okay, now I know. I have to ask you. Uh, would you like to answer to my comments, or should we open for comments, or it's up to you? I can, I'll be very short. Because okay. I really want to hear, how much time do we have all together? Uh, we have plenty of time. Okay, because yeah. I'd love to hear from yeah. others. So your first question is a big question in feminist thought, as you know, a question about subject. Who, who, who are we studying or who is our politics for? Um, I tried to present in my first opening slides that it started out being about women, but yeah. now feminist approaches are about everyone. Um, so it seems to me our subject area and even our objects of study, some of what feminists are doing in the United States is even questioning, questioning the research process because it puts people in such binaries um, that maybe we should even think about not or sharing our research and co-writing our research with people who we are chatting with and researching. And so I think that it, that's, because of that has expanded, I think that's a question that you and I could have um, in the United States, we'd say a beer and talk about a cerveza and conversation. Yeah, I love that. um, yeah. That's a really interesting point. Um, so thank you for raising that's really interesting. Um, let's see. The second one was just you're right. Of course, I presented these two case studies, and gosh, they make it sound like there weren't any real people with real agency. Singer itself, and so is International Harvester, were filled with resistance to it. And one of my other case studies I took out because I didn't have enough time. First of all, to say, of course, that Singer very consciously in their archive, I found lots of evidence, made clear not to mention that they provided sewing machines for women who worked in factories. That was never meant to be part of their publicity because it goes, it went against gendered ideology, CLs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one of the interesting case studies that I looked at in my book is one of the, um, the largest strike against Singer was started by women in their largest factory, which was outside of Glasgow, Scotland. Um, and it was started by a group of seven women in the needle room who were protesting the change of wage structure. Um, and it grew to be not only a national strike against Singer, but an international strike against Singer. And this uh, became so important that it was, part, it was relayed to the Russian factories, the second largest factory of Singers, to make sure that they didn't go out on strike, but they did in sympathy with the Glasgowies. So this was all actually started by women strikers. Um, so thank you for reminding me of what we can be, we should be centering, which is the agency of, of people, not only women, but men, people who have not necessarily always had their voice heard. Um, and they're, they're it's be quite famous in, in Scottish history, and it's very famous. Singer actually then changed its tactics globally about how to handle its workers. I'm not sure it was any better. They became very paternal. 
they began to provide health care, they began to, you know, they, they developed a way of thinking about the factory as a family, and they would take care of you, and this is how they sort of tried to quell labor unrest. So that's just another way, so there was, yes, yeah, so thank you for reminding me of the most, some of the most important things, which we have to talk about how we can resist these racial and patriarchal forms of capitalism. Um, gender ideology, we know, thank you for that too. Um, the way I was using it is to say at certain times and places there are certain dominant but not wholly comprehensive ways that a society decides, probably according to its you know, belief system, its religious belief systems, belief in capitalism, to say what the correct woman and the correct man should be, a dominant idea of what it is to be a proper woman and a proper man. Those ideas changed, but they were very, for me, what was interesting about studying this time is it seems to me it was the roots of what becomes, when America does become, in the post-war year, a global power, the roots of that seem to be seeded in this time frame. So I was trying to understand a dominant way, not the only way, and there were many ways of resisting this, and there were many people who did. So that's a very um, interesting thing to think about. Um, and in terms of what was happening in the American South, an international harvester, I, uh, I, I hope to say I have a book manuscript, my next and last book, but um, uh, looking at this larger project, and my way of thinking about it, which really changed a lot of what I studied, was to think about what it meant. I actually start the book with a woman who I actually know and met her granddaughter, who was a black woman who um, uh, worked for the United States government in leading some of these reform efforts. And I tried to think about what it meant to both be a resistor to what was happening in forms of capitalism, racial capitalism, but also a participant in it. And I, she starts the book and then I follow through her by, for exactly the reasons you were saying, to try to give agency and find words for people who didn't have words. And it's very interesting for me, it's complicated. Um, it has to, it changes the, the story and it's a good thing, but it's been very good, intellectually good, but I also think it's more true to what happened. So that's how I've tried to think about that. And then your last point about making place, I think you get, you're trying to talk about the agency of people. Yeah. Um, and, and here, you know, this again, the United States government hired black women, particularly black women, to deal with other black women uh, in the South to try to teach them better health and cooking habits, particularly because the labor force, almost all cotton in the United States was picked by black tenant farmers. And um, without a labor force, there would be no cotton. And cotton was, I said, valued at a, a cost of over a billion American dollars in 1915. That's in 1915. It was the largest American export. So capitalism was relied upon a kind of form of racialized labor. Um, and so that, yes, this was a very interesting. So I was really trying to think about what it would mean to be a woman who was both hired by the United States government, a black woman, to help other women, but all the while she knew what she was, what she could barely do, what she could do and what she could barely, what was her agency and what she, what were the structures and what she was working and it's a, I guess it's, she was caught in a patriarchal racial capitalism. Yeah, or the problem with the token woman, right, as well. Yeah. Yes, I mean, she, well, there, there were many other women. They were, it was interesting, it's interesting. But that's tomorrow's talk. Okay. So thank you for all of that. Thank you for those really thoughtful, insightful comments and I'd love to hear from Okay, thank you, Mona. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Dr. Gloria Ornelas, please. Fascinating topic, thank you very much, both of you, very uh, enriching. Uh, Mexico has a geography with overlapping and compounding, I love those two words, historic realities. I mean, we have the, the parallel uh, three uh, themes that you touched upon. Women governed and defined by their bodies, their physical pertinence to the man, uh, being owned by the man, and space uh, creating the identity even with their name. Uh, and that second step we also have women being defined by their labor. And that sets social strata uh, apart and uh, as a racial thing. 
So indigenous people here are also seen as inferior, but again, they are being owned. Mm -hmm. so, so it has to do with property, how the mm -hmm. man uh, first has a reproductive extension in women through his wife, and she is possessed by him. We have this reality now. And, uh, and we ha also have this labor where the, the owner has somebody working for her, whether it be uh, a, a, um, an enterprise or not. Mm -hmm. And now we have this new upcoming ideology, the geography of ideology. Uh, th the three instances, mm -hmm. to my mind, are being set by the geography of ethics. It would seem that uh, this clear separation between what is right and what is wrong is what controls the three instances. One defining your sexuality, what is allowed and what isn't allowed. If it, it, and it becomes a sin to own your own body. Uh, the same with labor. Uh, you, you aspire to a higher social strata because this is what is right. This is what you would mm. want. And again, the ethics in ideology, uh, the freedom, we still don't have that third evolution. Uh, and I, I do see it as something being evolved, gender evolution, from being limited to a sexuality reproduction to the labor part that makes you help and work for others. And this new ideology where it, it's a difference in thinking as we have the technology to see how the brain functions. You can see that the male uses the front to the back neurologic uh, networking and women use both hemispheres. It's a different type of ideology. It's a different way of perceiving the world. So uh, we see that gender uh, has these three steps that you talked upon, and we still have them. Uh, now, the turn of the century was very interesting. I'm sure Singer uh, made the Singer sewing machine for his mother. <laughs> and again, we have Carl Jung and, and Freud starting with this Oedipus. <laughs> I mean, he didn't do it to start an e enterprise. He probably did it to make his mother happy because, and to make, again, what is very interesting, making clothes and this home thing. You have to protect your little ones. You are here to, to bring your children up, to feed them properly. You are here to, to and then again, the cotton, uh, to wear these clothes. Again, it, it's dominance. And it takes us back to the basics. Relationships are set by power. And it's all a power struggle. But the name of the game it changes. It's not, no longer sexuality. It's no longer labor. And it now has to do with decision making and uh, to limit decision making in our world today just to one hemisphere is retrograde. Thank you very much. Would you like to comment on that, or shall we open up to the uh, to different questions? We have plenty of questions, so maybe you want to. Oh, just have. Yeah. But that was a lot. Thank you for, for putting things together. That was really interesting to hear that. Um, yeah, I think I try not to think so much because because of the, my work thinking about how the discourse of evolution 
um, has led to so many um, unfortunate ways of creating hierarchies in the world that I try not to think about things as a linear progression. But it is true to think through the ways in which gender and race and other forms of difference um, through time and space still it's still about power and relationships and however they get they, you know, they get to known. So I just think that's interesting to hear your take on that. So thank you. Okay, we have plenty of questions here. And I'm going to read them out to you. I like um, I'm going to start with the ones that are written in English and then I will do my translating exercise. Uh, this comes from Fatima. Uh, she says, for me, it is very interesting, this idea of women as civilizer, speaking about singer sewing machines, because mainly in geography, we know that historically, one of the ideas of domination in gender of men over women is related with a classic and ancient idea of women associated to nature and men to culture um, with civilization. So civilization has to win over nature. Then we have domination of men over women, but women as Civilizer is contradictory, isn't it? How do you see it? How do you understand it? Whew, wow, that's big. That's big, Fatima. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's sort of when you take a, you know, can maybe a class in American gender history. Um, we know, first in general, almost all ideologies are contradictory. Right? They contain within them many contradictions. Identity. And that's what's, yeah, so great, actually. And that's how we can undermine them, is to understand their contradictions. Um, yes, that's totally correct. Um, what was happening in the early 19th century is women were mobilizing for suffrage and the vote. Um, they began to use some of that, um, they tried to use the ideology against itself um, in some ways, and to say, oh, no, we, we, we I mean, we're not like men. We, we're, we're, not, we're not out there with our weapons and our machines. We're out there with our care and better clothing and better ways of organizing the household and the city. There were a lot of city movements, reform movements begun by women. So yes, it's contradictory. It is contradictory, and that is in fact what is almost through every ideology is filled with contradictions. And part of our job as scholars is to point them out, find them, highlight them, and to use them in ways to show how they, they are not ever dominant, right? They're, they're filled with the mess. But yes, women in the early 19th century um, and Singer jumped right on that bandwagon, uh, took a, a notion of civilization and turned it on its head so that women, and it was part of the women's suffrage movement, right? So it was part of women's suffrage to, to get vote. They had to show that they had a place in the civilizational hierarchy and this was gonna be their place. So thank you for that great question. Uh, next up, um, it is very interesting. How do you integrate it, the ideologies of progress and liberation by using a sewing machine um, or other products in past centuries. I would like to know if women, feminist women, criticized those concepts, um, those concepts integrating the intersection of working and enslaved women. And also today, the feminist geography speciality group, how are you redefining concepts? <laughs> Tough. <laughs> yeah, I can understand, sorry. Uh, how are you redefining concepts, uh, the real meaning of liberation, and the interpretation of slavery, violence in current times? Wow, can I see? Yes. <laughs> I forgot about the first part. Ah. It's, well, I think in some ways this might echo some of your points that you were asking. Um, so one, maybe one is about Singer and one is more general about the, the politics of American feminist geography. Um, yes, there were always people objecting to the dominance of gender ideologies in the United States. Many of them were people who worked at Singer. As I said, some of the first large strike was actually women workers in this factory. Um, and there are many examples of the ways in which the feminist movement, while being both contradictory um, and itself having very bad racial politics, used women's position as civilizers to promote themselves. That was part of an early feminist politics. Um, but the second question maybe is more pertinent just to all the people out here in the, in the audience. Um, 
I think, you know, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm not old, but I'm significantly older than most people in this room. That's a good thing. That means that we have a future in our discipline and what's happening. Um, but I was part of what was called the women's liberation movement, uh, second wave feminism. Mm. Um, and that really used the discourse of liberation, of, of freedom, which was a discourse really of the, of the civil rights movement, United States civil rights movement, racial rights movement in the 60s and 70s. And it's funny when you use that word, I don't know whose question this is, that, that, that made me think of that. That's not a word we tend to use anymore. And that's a very interesting question. The name change is indicative of changes in the field but it wasn't without contention. Um, because people thought if we go to something more, more general called feminist geographies, which could apply to almost everybody or everything, do we lose our politics of liberation? Do we lose our politics of fighting for women's rights in the academy, for example, or for having gender rights in the country, for example, or we saw a science here about abortion rights and so on and so forth. So it's not without its own controversy, the change in name or the change in the way things are happening. To give you one example, I was actually the, the I'm, I'm you know, doing a little advertising for myself, I guess. I co-founded this journal called Gender, Place, and Culture. And we um, had many, um, lots of contention about the journal, and particularly the name that followed the colon, a journal of feminist geography, because feminist gave it a real politics, and a lot of people didn't want to have the politics to it. And one of the first battles we fought, and one of the early contentions in the, I guess that would be the late 90s, is whether we could have men on our editorial board. So who's, who's liberation, who's, and who's are we? And that was it's a very interesting battle. So this is the same, again, I'm not sure whose question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I would love to talk to you later about the politics of gender and feminism in the American Academy, I'm sure in the Mexican Academy, and the way it also plays out in the, the public and the politics. It's just very interesting. So all of these things are sort of been under contention. I would say. Um, I have tried to group some of the questions by topics. I don't know if I'm going to succeed, um, but let's see. Um, uh, uh, okay, this one. In today's neoliberal context, what is it that the U.S. is marketing to the rest of the world, and how these new products um, make ways of how these new products um, way, ways of life change gender ideologies mm. today? Uh, that's one, and the other says in a time when gender is now transcending its binary characteristic has it, its binary characteristic how has the hegemonic power and I can't understand what it says sorry uh, how has the hegemonic power and market been capitalizing on new identities oh, no. okay so there's this <laughs> Um, and I think there's another one on, on well, I think this one, yeah, just this one <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, wow. I'll make sort of a, a joke, but it's not really a joke. So um, when Federico first asked me to come and give a talk, I think he first gave me a title, maybe not for this one, but it would be like, tell us about... America, U.S. under the world of Trump. Is that right? And I thought, oh my God, I can't do that. <laughs> but so um, I, I am no expert at answering these questions more than any you, I think, have your opinions are just as, as interesting as this. Um, I just finished teaching a, a senior seminar, so this is for our graduating students, um, a seminar in geography called Geography and Empire. So we read some historical things, and then we, we read a lot of contemporary work about the neoliberal economy in, in the United States and neoliberal economic geography in the United States. Um, and the students were very good to p pull out and think about the ways in which the exceptionalism, you've probably heard that, U.S. exceptionalism, and, you know, and in some ways I was trying to point to that, you know, somehow the women are better, the technology is better. We, are, we have empire not by wars, but by, okay, that was early 20th century. Um, how that's still, the threads of that are still quite amazing. Um, I remember when, when Bush II 
got up and delivered his speech saying that, you know, the war was over. Of course, the war wasn't over. It was just chock full of exceptional uh, ideas about the U.S. is still the exceptional global power for whom human rights are high above everything else. That's clearly not the case under the Trump world, so maybe that's one of the, the more realistic version of the empire is there. Um, and so now I think if we want to think about what corporations are representing this, we really have to look at uh, everybody's phone right now, unless you have your Chinese Huawei. Um, we're looking at Google and Amazon and Facebook. I think they own pretty much everything I have in my, my bag right here. And uh, the insidiousness of which that is happening is very interesting. And I don't, I have no, I have colleagues in my department who give much better answers to this than than I can, and one of our colleagues got his degree at UNAM, so um, he would be a better answer for that. Um, uh, yes, and the second question is very interesting. I mean, it is true that now we're talking about identities. Um, uh, we don't even use in the United States now the pronouns. We're trying to not use the pronoun he, she. We're trying to think of they, because it's just so multiple identities. Um, and I'm sure cap corporations are jumping on all the po potential capitalist potentials of that, right? All the different ways we can sell products and to new, new, to you know, difference, making difference and creating difference. Niche markets is the way capitalism is thriving. So, I, I think you're probably all right, and I'm not the best person to answer that question. So, <laughs> well, there's this whole new trend on genderless uh, clothing, right? That has to do a bit with right. this idea of non-binary mm -hmm. identities. So, right. And um, I mean, I wonder who's doing who's this. making that. Yeah. 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 Probably women in sweatshops in Probably Bangladesh and yes, Mexico. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So, could you please give us an example of why you consider that capitalism is just one social comp component amongst others in the configuration of gender, and not a hegemonic element thereof? Well, you guys are asking very deep theoretical questions. Um, I would send you to J.K. Gibson Graham, The End of Capitalism as We Know It. Um, again, not a question for me necessarily to answer. Um, it's maybe spoken best these days by people who in the United States are theorizing around the term of racial capitalism, which is to actually think both historically, the makings of capitalism in its history, and also in its contemporary manifestations, uh, that it's based upon the construction of social difference according to race and gender. There's no way of separating capitalism from thinking about gender and race. And therefore, there's not one, I don't, I just, you know, I, mean, I, I believe in intersectionality. There's not, there's not a hierarchy of the ways that we understand hegemony. They work together. So you can think both historically in terms of the making of from feudalism to capitalism, which is what the new racial capitalist people are thinking through, or you could just be a believer like I am in the sense that uh, life is too complicated to have one force be the one that makes everything. It has always been based, capitalism has always been based from the beginning on the construction of unevenness, right? Un uneven labor, uneven gender, uneven racial categories. That's how it functions. So one goes with the other. That's, how, that's my belief anyway. Okay, this one reads, uh, congratulations um, to the speaker for on her uh, methodology um, for taking um, companies as generators of, um, do you say gender mandate in mm -hmm. English, is that, or gender roles, yeah? um, that, ma that can be identified at different scales, like uh, the body, domestic space, and that even uh, include um, an imperialist ideology um, of developed countries or modern countries uh, in comparison to underdeveloped countries, which uh, allows us to see the differences in in the US. I'm sorry, this is That's my okay. translation. I don't know if it was That's clear. Good. It's not really a question. It's yeah, more of a Yeah, thank you, whoever comment. raised that. Um, I was uh, inspired by um, people who do critical work in geography in the UK, and of course their their history, their historical geography was very much about the the way geography as a discipline when it was created was a tool of empire, and geographers went out to get things from other places and bring them back, 
And so there's been many interesting critical histories now written in the UK about the making of their empires, the many makings of their empires and the unmakings of those empires. And so I was inspired to think about what would it mean to think of a US empire at a time when it wasn't considered imperial. Um, when it was still, of course, it's always a settler colony, right? It itself is already its own internal empire. But, um, and so that's why, that's what got me to thinking about corporations and less about the government at that time. So corporations became a center of analysis because they were actually just going about doing it. Um, they were setting up the, a, an economic dominance over other peoples. And so that is how that methodology came to me. It seemed that's what was happening. I mean, the way that Singer created... Um, dominance or hegemony or reliance, we might say, is something similar to what we think see of today with debt financing, which is almost every singer sewing machine, not only in the United States, but everywhere in the world, was bought on credit. And was the first form of credit for most people, including in the United States. And that's the way that they kept everybody in their power, in their debt. And we do know, for example, in the Russian Revolution in 1917, 1918, the very first things that were destroyed uh, were singer shops. They had singer shops in every small town in Russia. And they took the books, the, the counting books, that had everyone's debt listed there, and they burned them. So that just gives you a sense of why corporations as imperial, early forms of empire wow. <laughs> and dominance, yeah. Um, in your opinion, what could be today's equivalent of sisterhood as the one presented in the singer sewing machine case? Um, so what would be the... Uh, mm. I think you were aiming at something earlier with the previous answer. Yeah, well, maybe we... Hmm. Um, there's many ways to think about that. Um, so politically, I think we talked about the idea of strategically, strategic essentialism. I think that's what it's called, where sometimes strategically women do have to say, we, had, we do have some things that are common to us that we need to, even though we're different, we need to have, we need to strategize about that. But more insidiously, in terms of what's happening in capitalism, um, I, it is still true that the American government, for example, in its development, again, I put development in quotes, that's just a term that was made up as an imperial tool, right? It's about imperialism. But development as a form of imperialism still uses very government very explicitly the idea that American women are the judge by which we, we, we put other countries on a ladder. So I guess that's another form of the sisterhood of, of women. Um, so, as long, you know, as long as we get all those other women in India, you know, using, let's see, today they would be owning their own um, micro-debt um, phones and starting their own businesses, then we'll have solved poverty. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, this is a social justice question. Um, social injustice continues today in the 20th, 21st century, um, in particular in Mexican farms. What could be some uh, ideas to eliminate or eradicate those social injustices? <laughs> yes, we want an answer. Yes, uh, I, well, <laughs> I smile because I wish I, I wish I had answers. Um, uh, well, you know, I think many of your students and you're here striking for other reasons. I think you're not here representing farm workers, but you are here striking, and that's one way. I mean, change only happens when people make resistances to their global power. So um, we have in our everyday lives making decisions about what it is we believe in. I can't say I'm, I'm totally, a U, my research has always been about the United States, and therefore, I, and I don't even have any answers to talk to you about in terms of U.S. farm workers, um, except to say that they're to organize and strike. But um, in terms of the Mexican situation, I'm afraid I just don't, I just don't know enough, and I wouldn't even try to impose my my views. I'm ignorant. Um, no, it's all right. Uh, it would be unfair to ask you to solve our <laughs> problems with the farms in Mexico. Um, this one reads. Um, it started as a movement, but nowadays, do you think environmentalist, um, suppose environmentalism has become a speech of capitalism, just like the gender, just like gender played, played a role in imperialism? Mm. Wow, these are, again, big questions. Thank you all. <laughs> 
I wish I had answers. I mean, some of the biggest questions we're facing, right, today, it's probably, I mean, I'm sure you're right. Is the first part really about, is it environmentalism and capitalism? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I teach in a department of geography, and we sit in a building right next to the Department of Environmental Studies. Many, in many US academies, uh, the department is the Department of Geography and the Environment. In our, in our university, they're separate. But it's been interesting to me because there actually are different differences. So that the, strangely, the Department of the Environment at our place actually believes that capitalism can solve environmental problems. So they're all into carbon trading and you know, all sorts of things. Um, where uh, somehow the geographers are a little more skeptical and a little more critical of the ways in which capitalism can solve environmental issues. Um, that's not to say we have to have a revolution immediately, but the form of capitalism, the neoliberal capitalism that we're living under right now does not seem to be necessarily a way of thinking through uh, anything to, that would really save our environment. But that's just looking at the world from my little Dartmouth geography, environmental studies, um, some who are real believers in capitalism solving our environmental problems and some not. Okay. Um, we have two more to go. Okay. This one says, maybe not strictly related to the final part of the conference, but I think it does relate to the general topic. I wanted to know your opinion on the different movements, if not around the world, at least in Latin America, that want to establish a minimum percentage of female authors on university syllabi. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, wow, okay. Another question to be had over beers. Um, um, this is a very big question in the United States as well. Uh, I would say it's very much about intersectionality. So it's not just uh, uh, voices from women, it's about voices from underrepresented minorities, which in the United States is usually considered African-Americans, Latinx academics, indigenous scholars. Um, uh, how, how, how does social change happen in that way? When I was uh, lucky enough to be the president of our big association, the American Association of Geographers, I had to write a column every month. And I thought, when I got, to, I got this honor, I thought, oh my God, how can I have a column every month? I, you know, how could I have something to say every month? 12 things, you know, anyway. I found that I had actually had things to say. So one of them was about this, and I wrote a column saying, why is our discipline so white? And why is our curriculum so white? And I didn't necessarily have any answers to it, but I looked at something like course syllabi and so on and so forth. Um, and that is a similar question about why there's so few women on, on scholars noted on there. We, are, we have a, a related thing that you might be interested in as well. There's a, because of the Me Too movement, or not because of that, but because many people, people then have got given a voice and felt more emboldened. Um, we've started, some women have started thinking through issues about uh, very prominent scholars in American geography and in other disciplines who we all know were sexual abusers and harassers. And what do we do about them? They tend to dominate our syllabi. You know, everyone reads their books and cites them. So we, a group of us, a collective, wrote an essay about that. So if you're interested, I could share that. Um, and I've tried to enact my own politics. So in my latest, we just wrote this and thought about it in my own class on geography and empire. We read some things by a very famous geographer named Neil Smith, you may have heard of. Um, and I, our, our decision, collective decision making, was that we would try to include as many other voices as we could. But it's important to also remember who he was and what he had to say, but also then to tell people what else, what was, what else he did in his life. And so I did that, and that was very interesting kind of politics to enact in my classroom. Students, I think, were very interested in, in that. So sort of not, not to forget who people are, to mention who they are, but also to think about what they all were and you know, how maybe some of his prestige um, came through means that were about harassing his students. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have a question. Uh, it comes from Nati. Where are you at? Um, unrelated to your talk, yet I think a feminist idea which is crucial to understanding the student strike here. Could you talk about the notion of safe spaces? Um, yes, I'm not sure what, does it have a meaning here? 
No. Okay. Um, uh, does it mean something here? Uh, no. I, I don't know what exactly you have in mind. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Well, I've heard about the mm -hmm, classroom mm -hmm. as a safe space, like, for example, when you talk about whether or not use trigger warnings with mm -hmm, some students. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's different because it also mm -hmm. has to do with, yeah, people feeling that the university is a welcoming, safe place, that they won't be mostly, in particular, women won't be harassed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it goes... Is something like that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that's uh, that's great. I know Catherine Bickell's the new one of the new editors. So that's great that she's doing that. I think it has meant many different things. I mean, originally it was a lot of it was started in by by the kind of gay movement um, um, to create safe spaces in cities where you could express your sexual identity and not feel harassed. But I think it has and then has been taken up in many other kinds of ways. For a while at Dartmouth campus, we had a sticker we could put on our door or office or our classroom that said that nobody would be harassed there. Um, and they could speak their viewpoints without being feeling harassed. I think that's another version of safe space. At our geography conference now, we have a, a no harassment policy um, and it comes with notions of safe space built into the conference. So maybe that, yeah, it's interesting. To think about that. Okay, that's that's it for all the questions. Thank you very much. I hope they were, well, they were a bit tough, I have to say, <laughs> but I hope they were helpful. Tough and, and big and yes. very exciting. Thank you for thinking uh, with me and helping me think through these issues. Yes, really nice. So Thank now, you. yeah, please. Um, just one last comment. Um, this one will be in Spanish. Um, el Seminario Permanente Paisaje y Geografía Cultural, el Colegio de Geografía de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, el Instituto de Geografía, el Centro de Investigaciones y Estudios de Género y la Dirección General de Cooperación e Internacionalización de la UNAM agradecen su asistencia y les invitamos a acudir mañana a las 12 horas en el auditorio anexo al Instituto de Geografía a la conferencia New Trends in Cultural Geography con la profesora Domos. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was lovely. Thank you so much oh, for your comments. So I thoughtful. Like it sense. Yes. Kind of yeah, no, no, no. It was amazing, really. It's been great. Uh, thank you for being.